are pleased to present some research that we've undertaken around girls and STEM perceptions and some interesting findings around what they think about and how they perceive the STEM subjects, but also STEM as a possible avenue for their careers. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce this session simply because STEM has been the mainstay of a flagship program called Girls to Pioneers that we have run for the last seven years. Um, the program started in 2014, and over the years, it's just grown from strength to strength. We've been expanding and deepening the curriculum, adding relevant topics, topics that um, will in fact be super uh, relevant, but also um, profitable, hopefully, for, for girls in, as they start to uh, embark on their careers. Um, and it's also been a journey for us, especially last year, given COVID, that we were able to move the STEM program online. So we now have STEM at home, and much of the curriculum is now available to schools, to these girls, um, to, to work on while at home, and, and as well as in the school environment. Uh, we've also expanded our distribution and our outreach um, across different types of schools, different stakeholders, um, and different cohorts of young girls and growing it into young women. So this afternoon, we're very pleased to um, start off and kick off the session uh, by having our knowledge and research partner, Ipsos, to present the results of this research um, undertaking, which we started earlier this year. Um, I, should, I should indicate that, in fact, it is the second piece of primary research that we've done. We started something last year, um, and this is the continuation. And um, I just wanted to introduce to you Melanie Ng, who is Country Service Lines Group Leader, Market Strategy and Understanding at Ipsos. And she will provide us with the findings um, of this research that has been undertaken earlier this year. Go ahead, Melanie. Thank you. Thank you, Georgette. And a very good afternoon to everyone. It's really my pleasure to be able to share some of key insights uh, from a recent survey that we have conducted. Um, well, before I begin, uh, I think it would be good for me to set the scene. If we can uh, share the slides and move on to the next slide. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Anu. The next slide, please. All right, okay, so I just want us to set scene by first aligning with you on the definition of STEM, okay? STEM, it's a curriculum based on the idea of educating students in four very specific disciplines. We're talking about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, I've provided some examples of the study areas of each of the disciplines, just to give you a sense of the breadth of topics covered in STEM. And we all know that it is one of the fields that has shown strong and very consistent growth and presents many promising career opportunities for our graduates every year. Next slide, please. Okay, so with every piece of research, uh, I would like to make sure that everyone understand what we are covering in this piece of research. So uh, the first point here, it's really around identifying the reasons for the choices made by the students with regards to a STEM or a non-STEM pathway in their consideration of higher education options and career choices. The second reason for doing this research is because we were really keen to really want to find out, is there indeed a confidence gap issue you know, in goals pursuing STEM majors and also identify some of the possible reasons. And similarly, to determine the triggers and the barriers for a career in STEM, not just, you know, putting uh, education around STEM, but really pushing all the way to also start uh, a career in STEM as well. So what are the triggers? What are some of the barriers? And lastly, we want to understand 
who are the role models around our students and what's their spheres of influence in terms of helping them make a choice on subject majors and to also career choices. All right, so with these four things in mind, let's move on to the next slide here. Uh, I'll give you an idea in terms of who we cover as well. And so this survey is conducted among Singaporean and PR students. We have a total of uh, 600 respondents and all the surveys that are conducted online. Okay, so with 600 respondents, it's a very decent sample size here. Okay, for a very niche segment of those aged between 16 and 25 years old. Okay, which means that it gives us ample data points as we slice and dice the data to look at finding differences across majors, across genders, across even the subgroups within 16 to 25 years old. There is equal representation of uh, boys and girls, and uh, there's also a good representation of uh, various races within the profile of our respondents. And all of these surveys were conducted uh, end December last year, stretching a little bit to the beginning of Jan. Okay, now, so let's take a look at how far STEM has penetrated as a curriculum of choice. Okay, so which means the extent to which STEM being a potential choice in the next journey, and lastly, STEM being a preferred career of choice. And all of these will give us an, a sense of the demand and the value of STEM as a subject majors and also as a career. Okay, so from this slide here, you can see a very, if you, if you start to, to eyeball from the left to the right, you will see a consistent increase in the percentages, which means that STEM is being picked up as the subject, major, and career of choice as they move along, okay? Now, we also see that three quarters of them are likely to stick to their current majors as they progress, okay? So, which means that people are unlikely to change their mind. Most of them will continue to stick to whatever that they have picked as their majors, and they continue to progress, you know, along that journey. Next slide, please. Okay, so are there differences across genders? The answer is yes, you can tell here. Uh, you know, have a look at the slide here and the, and the left and the right percentages. Now, these are the top three subjects of interest picked by the respondents, by the students, okay? And you can tell here that the subjects that they have picked, you know, which are my top three uh, preferences and, and, and preferred choices, they are actually quite different. Now, all the top three subjects of interest from the males, are actually all STEM related. And the reverse is true, you know, for the females. All top three of interest among the females are non-STEM majors. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is an interesting slide because it gives us an idea of when major considerations around STEM versus non-STEM, when are they made? And also the implication on the importance of intervention before this age, just so that we are in the right position to encourage females or more females to take on STEM. So have a look at the aggregate data here. The age band that peaks in terms of girls changing their mind from STEM to non-STEM, it's around 15 years old, right? So it kind of hoovers, if you look at that, that uh, line uh, chart here, Move us around 14, 15, 16, 17. You know, uh, not surprising because this is, uh, you know, the point that they are making quite a lot of decisions around what subjects to major, where to move on in terms of my next education journey. Next one. Okay, we now get into a little bit of reasons. Okay, so let's try and understand what are the reasons that drive them to pursue STEM and later on we will do for the reasons that helps deter them from pursuing STEM, okay? So I've, I've, we've summed it, uh, you know, in, in three sentences here, there are probably more, okay? But I was saving up the, the, the ones that's a little bit more uh, prominent in terms of figures. Now, apart from genuine interest, right? Okay, so on the first sentence, I'm genuinely interested in STEM subjects. We also have uh, future growth prospects being cited, Okay, that STEM subjects will give me better future growth uh, prospects. 
And the third reason here that's been mentioned is it open doors to higher paying jobs in the future, okay? So here you see a slight difference between the males and females. So obviously a little bit more males agreeing to the statement than the females, okay? And of course, noting also the higher interest uh, in STEM subjects among males than females. Okay, moving on to why girls not pursuing STEM then? All right, okay. Now, these are some of the reasons uh, that has been cited. Okay, we reverse the lens here and we look at top reasons for not wanting to pursue, okay, including the males as well. Okay. So let's have a look at the sentences here. I find STEM subjects difficult. That's really a challenge for the females. You see 48% compared to 28% of the males. I'm not interested in the STEM subjects. Okay, again, you see a higher percentage of females, you know, citing this reason. And the third one, it's about the subjects not being relevant to what I want to do in my future. And the fourth one is quite an interesting one, and I'd like you to hold your thoughts a little bit because I'll touch on this um, later on in the presentation. It's STEM subjects don't allow me to express my creativity. Okay, at least that's the perception. Now, the intensity of that is not as high as finding STEM subjects difficult, but nonetheless, this is still the top five reasons. And the last one, it's about, I don't think I will fit in with other students who usually take STEM subjects. Okay, so I'm not sure whether there is a stereotype around a typical STEM versus non-STEM students, perhaps. Okay, so something to think about. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, uh, one slide up, please, Sammy. Yes. Uh, no, one slide down. Oops, it goes. Yes, this is the one. Thank you. All right. Okay, so now this is despite the fact that you know more than four in five actually agree that STEM jobs are high paying and it offers exciting opportunities, right? Across the board, students, they know, you know, they know that STEM jobs are good, you know, in terms of pay, the, the, they offer pretty exciting opportunities. So our girls, uh, no exception as well, they actually do recognize the material benefits and the, uh, the future prospects, but still fewer of them would want to choose a STEM career. Okay, so let's look a little bit further here. We also found two data points that are quite interesting here. We found most differences across males and females, in particularly for those two sentences. Uh, one says, STEM job allows me to pursue my interests, okay? The other one talks about a good work-life balance, okay? So we have less females actually agreeing with these statements. Next slide, Emma. Okay, here we saw about a quarter of the girls being unsure if STEM should be a potential career. So it's not all the case whereby girls will go like, no, that's not for me, okay? We do have about 25% of the people actually not being 100% sure, okay? The reason cited, quite understandable, uh, relatively lower understanding uh, about STEM career, okay? 41% of them cited that, and having less experience in STEM internship, okay? So typically when the girls go for internship, perhaps STEM-related uh, jobs are either not available or not being pursued, okay? So in over, overall, just less experience with that. Next slide, please. Okay, so another set of very interesting findings, but perhaps not that surprising too, okay? Uh, majority, females included, will agree that STEM are more for males, okay? Um, I'll leave you to kind of glance through the sentences here. Girls are generally less interested in STEM, you know. So basically, this question is like, do you agree or you not, right? You know, so we have more females, you know, who are agreeing that yeah, girls are generally not interested in STEM. But equally, we do have about a, a third of the males um, citing the same uh, point too. The second sentence here is about STEM jobs tend to have um, more males than females working in them. Society and media generally do not encourage girls to choose STEM jobs. And parents generally also do not encourage girls to choose STEM jobs. 
The other one is quite interesting. Girls are not strong in STEM subjects. Okay, and the working condition in STEM jobs are not suited to females. Okay, so I, I guess these are things that perhaps we have heard of and, you know, maybe we can discuss a little bit later, but to me, this is not all surprising, but fairly interesting to see the differences between the males and the females. Next, please. Um, Sorry, one slide off. Yes, okay, thank you. Now, this is compounded by the fact that some of the students are also lacking in confidence, right? You know, that I'm not, it's not, I'm not qualified enough. It's a little bit too competitive. Um, I don't have the right connection, okay. Now, so we can touch on this a little bit more, uh, especially on the last point in terms of connection. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I've also pulled this out, you know, where we saw girls stating that uh, they have less industry connection. Okay, um, so I don't personally know anyone working in the STEM field with 44% of the girls citing that. Okay, now is that a cost of, you know, the lack of familiarity and maybe directly or indirectly reducing the confidence level perhaps? Yeah, and, and I, I think it calls for a lot of rooms uh, for us to be able to support the females with better networking, mentorship opportunities, those are really critical to help them know more people in the industry and really just start with a stronger familiarity. Next. Okay, so we also got them to kind of uh, uh, look into the traits, you know, what are some of the traits that's typically associated with STEM well, versus non stand field? Okay, uh, obviously there's some, some traits that really cuts across, you know, both STEM and non-STEM. I'm not highlighting them. I'm only pulling apart those that's quite uniquely being associated with STEM. And here we have things that, that's a little bit more tech savvy, analytical, good with numbers, technical, uh, intelligent. So these are all the attributes that's associated with STEM fields. Okay, and then on the right side, you know, things that's not associated with STEM are really, about, you know, a lot more fun-loving, creative, so very different set of traits, um, you know, that's being associated with STEM versus non-STEM. Next, please. Okay, then, of course, unfortunately, you know, for those traits that are seen as unique to STEM fields, we have less females, you know, rating them, you know, the, the, the ratings among the, the, the females are, are definitely lower as well. Next, please. Okay, so if you recall in one of the earlier slides, I talk about a statement about STEM subjects, you know, don't allow me to express my creativity. And so here you go, you know, this is another findings that's supporting that. Uh, we ask the students to rate skills based on the level of importance for a successful STEM career. And you see that creativity, it's really ranked fairly low um, at a position of number 10 here, okay? Uh, problem solving, analytical, attention to details, critical thinking, these are the top five that students feel it's really critical for a successful STEM career. Next slide, okay. Um, well, I, I guess, of course, we know this is not true, right? You know, because creative thinking complements or contributes to problem-solving skills. Uh, we all need that in any jobs that we perform. And so it's just as important for STEM, just like many other skill sets as well. Okay, so uh, something for us to think about and, and uh, perhaps something for us to push, you know, from a messaging perspective. Okay, now, before I get into the role model, uh, just very quickly in terms of... Um, these specific fields and stats. So even if, you know, it doesn't matter if males or females here, but if they're picking STEM, we ask them for the subjects, you know, that they would prefer. So again, we see differences here, right? You know, the males are leaning towards a little bit more towards the T of, you know, which is technology here. And the females are picking things that's maybe skewing a little bit more towards the S and the M here. So the subject preference are also different, okay? What is common to, between the two genders here? It's data scientists, um, data analytics. Now these areas appeared to be equally interested 
uh, across both genders. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, this is the last objective that I talk about. You know, who are the people around our students? Who are the role models? Who are the influencers? And it's very clear, perhaps quite predictable here as well. Um, and good thing here is parents still have the greatest sphere of influence, just as much as the peers, friends, and seniors are uh, slightly just on a higher end in terms of uh, the percentages. So it's still being talked uh, as the most critical, I would say, stakeholder around the, the students who have an influence in terms of helping them make choices. Next slide. Okay, um, I have covered essentially the major findings. Uh, what I'd like to do is to, to just maybe summarize a couple of food for thoughts before we open up for the panel discussion. Next slide. Okay, so two more slides to go here. The first point here is really about early intervention. Okay, we saw earlier on that around 14 to 16 year old, it's roughly the time that they're going to make the most serious decisions or considerations around what to do next, what subject to take next. Okay, so it's critical that if there is any intervention, any encouragement, any education to be done, it should be done as early as possible before that age group. Okay, and in anything that we do, okay, always focus on enhancing understanding. We saw a lack of understanding, a lack of familiarity. We saw the confidence level being lower among the females. So push for that enhancement of understanding and also among students as well as parents so that, you know, all, everybody who's around the students will possibly have a say or have a word with the students, or, you know, have some kind of influence to encourage them in a positive way to withstand, you know, they're there to support them. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, you know, creativity, that, that really hurts a little bit when I saw the findings, uh, you know, so I definitely would go for this point about repositioning stand to really highlight the creativity aspect of it, you know, and perhaps let's add an A to, you know, STEM, you know, to have STEAM <laughs> instead of STEM, uh, where the elements of arts and creativity are really not being left out, they're not being compromised, even as one pursues STEM, okay? Um, focus on education, I mentioned that earlier on, raising awareness, deepening understanding, and correcting any misperceptions that may exist in today's context right now. And lastly, inspiration. I, I really think that's so important in everything that we do. Um, we need a fee we need more female role models, maybe more success stories, you know, to share shining experiences to inspire more females. We want to avoid a situation where females fail or feel intimidated by the expectation, by the complexity of STEM, and thinking that they will fall short, they will be behind if they pursue STEM. And, and that's not what I want as a female. I want to be a hit, right? Not behind. But will the pursuant of, of stand, you know, let me to that uh, or otherwise? All right. So that's my very last slide, uh, which I hope uh, will leave, you know, some useful insights with you and also a couple of food for thoughts for further discussion. Back to you, George. Right. Okay. Um... Hang on a second, here we go. All right, thanks very much, Melanie, appreciate that. Thank you for giving us those top line findings. I hope everybody on the, on the Zoom uh, webinar here found them interesting. And again, um, these are top line findings. There were more um, details and we'll be releasing them over time, but we wanted to give you the first snapshot um, and with this, I really should be at this point thanking Corteva uh, because it was with their support that we were able to do this research piece. Um, and it was with not just the, 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 uh, the financial contribution, but also their support because they understand that this is a really important um, area of growth for girls uh, in the future. So it's with that, I am very pleased to introduce our first panelist. Um, it's 
It's Elizabeth Hernandez, and Elizabeth leads Corteva AgriSciences' external engagement strategy in Asia Pacific. She advances the company's brand and reputation. She develops strategic relationships with governments across the region, as well as other stakeholders um, across food and agricultural ecosystems. She also, on top of that, manages sustainability uh, initi initiatives for Cotiva in the region. Now, I've known Elizabeth for a good number of years and, um, and is a personal friend of mine. And I can say she is without the doubt, one of the most reputable, amazing, inspirational female leaders in the region. So thank you for joining us, Elizabeth. It's a real pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. And um, our second panelist is Professor, uh, Professor Sirin Lim. Um, Sirin Lim is Associate Professor of Bioengineering at the School of Chemical and Biomedical Engineering at NTU, Nanyang Technological University. She currently serves as the Associate Dean for Global Partnerships at NTU Graduate, uh, Graduate College, as well as uh, is co-deputy executive director of the NTU Institute of Health Technologies. I think you might find it interesting that her bioengineered and applied nanomaterials laboratory, I think the nickname is Bian's Lab, um, also focuses on the design and engineering of hybrid nano micro scale devices from biological parts by utilizing protein engineering as a tool. Now, here's the interesting thing. It's the applications. The applications are in health, cosmetics, food, and the environment. So, Sirin, thank you for joining us. Delighted to have you with us. Um, so I have my two panelists here. Let me start by saying first, Interesting results, interesting findings from that STEM piece of research. Um, it's nothing like research to, to kick off anything, um, test hypotheses out there. Uh, if we are going to talk about STEM, we have to walk the talk ourselves. It starts with research. Um, can we, let's, let's throw open the first question to the both of you. What is it that we need to be doing to encourage girls to be taking up STEM at an earlier age. Elizabeth, can I start with you, your thoughts? Sure, thanks, Georgia. Uh, one of the things, I'm glad you're talking about encouraging girls at a much younger age, right? Because as a, coming from the corporate sector, we tend to see the problem when we're trying to recruit young graduates and there's not enough of women candidates among that group that are interested in the role. So we recognize that we have to go, go much further and we've worked with companies or NGOs that taught STEM and, and, and brought that to the schools at university level, we did internship programs, but we recognize it's not enough. You have to go even much earlier than that, particularly in the field I'm in today, which is agriculture. You know, if you live in a city like Singapore, the last thing you're gonna think of is agriculture. However, if you think about where we are today with a, with a 30 by 30 goal of Singapore, we wanna be producing 30% of our food, suddenly agriculture, agri-tech or food tech, or even sustainability and climate change are making agriculture suddenly a new cool subject or career prospect for graduates here in Singapore. But how do we get that idea embedded as in the earlier ages? Because by college time, they've already made their decision, right? Even in high school, they're already kind of going into tracks, whether they're going to STEM or non-STEM. So it has to be much earlier. And so now with some of the programs we do, like the science outreach, into the schools, we're actually looking at primary school and supporting initiatives that are looking at how do we teach science, for example, today in primary school and bringing that creativity. So I can tell you my own daughters, I have three kids. My eldest daughter who's 29 tells me that as a young child in primary school, what something about science was so um, for her so much fun because it was about this creative exploration and discovery of the world around her. 
And so every day it was at the, nurturing this curiosity and this inquisitiveness of a young child and just discovering. There was nothing about right or wrong answer. It's just asking questions and exploring and trying and you know just discovery. But somewhere along the way, and maybe that's that gap that we see between 11 to 14 years, right? Where suddenly the focus becomes about memorizing formulas and testing, uh, taking those standardized tests and getting top grades, because if you don't get top grades, then you don't go into that track. And so something in that transition perhaps needs to be evaluated so that we don't lose um, that creative exploration of the world, I think, that is you see in young kids. And some of them are lucky enough to find a professor in high school or college that will bring that interest back. But there's so many others perhaps that we lose in that intervening years. That's one area that I would look for. Definitely start much younger, make it about exploration and fun. It's not about the testing and exact answer. And this will also link into the risk taking that we need for more entrepreneurial thinking and creative thinking that we need in solving the problems of the world. And today, when I think of the biggest problems we have to solve around sustainability and climate change, it definitely needs both. So I love the fact that you mentioned STEAM. I was going to say that because I really believe that you need both. And so my job, you know, I'm not a, STEM, a woman in STEM, but my job is to translate a lot of that information that our scientists are doing to bring that and address the problems of the world in agriculture and sustainability and in our food system. Thank you, Elizabeth. And, and um, you know, earlier on, you shared with, with us that uh, you're not from the STEM background, but, um, you know, all these years, I've always known you to be a really keen advocate for STEM and more recently STEAM. So, Shirin, um, let, me, let me extend that question. So, starting them younger, it's one piece. How do we keep them interested? How do we maintain that interest? How do we grow that interest? Especially you, as you see the girls and the students at university level. Yeah, thanks Georgette and thanks for Elizabeth. Uh, very interesting discussion. And, um, and Melanie, of course, uh, from the survey. Uh, interestingly, the survey that, they have, that you have done uh, basically look at students from earlier age to about 25 years old. Recently, we have uh, women at NTU through our POWERS program. POWERS stands for the promotion of women in engineering, research, and science, which pretty much what we, we, we are talking about, the addressing this gap particularly. Our recent survey actually found that even though the students are trained in STEM, uh, about 58% would pursue STEM career. In contrast, male, students who are training STEM, 70% of them would actually go to this to the, to the STEM career. And this is a, on a survey, on a national level survey, it's about 738 participants representing the Singapore population. And that was kind of an interesting uh, finding as well. So yes, Georgette, you're correct that it's about retain, retention at the post um, uh, that as well. And I think that uh, in order to keep them in, we thought that we come up with a three-prong approach, uh, something we abbreviate as CORE, C-O-R-E. So this is, we call it the power score. <laughs> C-O for connect, R for research, and E for educate. So the, the connect, we basically try to connect students to mentors, to peers, to uh, industry players, who they can basically, uh, with role models, basically to uh, make them see themselves in those roles, right? So that's connection. And then we also try to do some research, trying to understand uh, beyond the age of decision-making at 15 to 24, what else do they think is important in uh, keeping them there? So what we also found, which is kind of interesting, is that Singaporean women, they are interested in career domains, which is, consistent with what the uh, 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 Ipsos founding was that in a career of human social development and systematic systematic manipulation of data, which is uh, uh, these two are uh, social and conventional sort of uh, uh, career domains. 
But interestingly, what we saw is that they also prefer practical, orderly, and predictable work activities, as well as direct, that is directed toward economic achievement. Those are what women are interested in. So some of these uh, preferred activities, they actually are consistent with STEM careers. We need these kind of activities, or STEM has these kind of activities embedded in the career or job scope which probably not very, uh, uh, well, I guess, then lack of understanding of what STEM jobs are actually requiring. So I think that might need more socialization and, and, and this connection would actually help students to understand what uh, they, they, what it really is, me, what it means by having a STEM career. And I think that, um, and uh, um, uh, uh, the last piece, which is education, is, is basically this, to, under, to, to bring this finding and try to kind of uh, educate the students, uh, maybe the popul general populations, as, as what it is actually required as, as being in STEM and what can STEM job provide. Uh, what I think would be interesting is that the applications of STEM, right? So I think uh, Elizabeth mentioned this briefly, you probably also mentioned this briefly, that having studied STEM actually open up, you know, a plethora of, of function, job functions. Uh, having background in STEM uh, or being understanding what is engineering math, not only uh, provide you the tools to actually do the job in the future, but also just in general, understanding how the world works, what happened if uh, something breaks down in my home, I can fix it myself pretty much, right? I'm a trained engineer, by the way. So, so that actually is very useful for me as being uh, uh, living at home. Uh, and then, um, and then uh, one other thing I would like to also mention is that you don't need to be the most brilliant, uh, smartest cookie in the class to actually excel in STEM. I've seen in my, in my work for the last 13 years teaching, the best performers may not be the best student with the highest GPA. So that I think I would like to drive home that message is that you don't need to be the smartest kid in the block. Tests are tests, but then again, uh, it's how do you actually use that information and then apply those to the situations that is the most important part. And you do need somebody who is consistent, right? So that's very systematic. Women are very good at that, <laughs> um, just to saying this, but uh, yeah, then yeah, it, it really opens a lot of opportunities uh, just studying STEM. Uh, one example is that a lot of, uh, some of the students I've trained, they don't really wanna be doing bench work, which I think everybody has been thinking, okay, if you do STEM, you're gonna be working in the lab, working with, with heavy machineries or whatnot. Not some of them like that. I actually do like that kind of hands-on experiences, but you can also be a journalist, STEM journalist, right? So that actually needs your language skill, but you may only report that if you know a little bit about STEM and then it actually helps you um, uh, publicize that better, yeah. Georgia, can I add on that last? Please, please do. This is this is this is the fun part. <laughs> it's a very important piece there about like relating the STEM course into real jobs, right? Because we found that also in the work that we do, where we do this program in the schools. And at the beginning, before we do the intervention, like the science outreach program, the number of jobs they know in agriculture, especially when they think of agriculture, is just a farmer, right? Maybe someone in livestock. Right, farming. And this is a, in, even in places like Australia, where farming is actually a pretty big part of the industry, not here in Singapore. However, after we do the program, the intervention we have, where it's really kind of tapping some of that creativity into the different um, science subjects that they can apply in agriculture, at the end of the program, when we test them in terms of what are the different career roles, suddenly they know what an agronomist is, right? They know what breeders require. They know what genetics can do, you know, on some of the food um, science that we do. So suddenly the options, as I think Professor Lim said, just multiplies that just studying science, biology or chemistry isn't just going to be like a mathematician or biologist. What does that mean, right? But actually, this whole host of other um, career options that they have that they may not have thought of. And so I, I would agree with that. So the relatability, I think, of the career is important. So that internship opportunity is great. But then the other thing I would say, lastly, for women is I also think that you have to win hearts and minds, right? Sometimes the discussion around STEM is very much about the smarts, the skills, that kind of ability. And even the questions that I saw from the survey, it's you make more money, you'll be successful in your career. 
where actually a lot of the young people today are very much driven by passion and by purpose. It's winning the hearts. So when I talk about sustainability, climate change, and national agriculture being a big part of solving that problem, that excites them. And then maybe they'll consider going to a career in science or agriculture, not the other way around or starting from the subject, but actually trying to think of what will be meaningful impact that you can make in this world and maybe win, win them into STEM because of that, because of the problems that we can solve together. So really that, and no pun intended, that stems into um, creativity, right? It's, we have to be a lot more creative in the way we communicate the subjects and its applicability and its relevance. Um, and, this, and the fact that this is actually the pipeline for their future. Uh, Siren, um, what do you think about this whole aspect of creativity? Are you seeing um, it be the, from particularly in the academic space? Is there this move to try to be a lot more creative in the way, not, not just the subject matter, but also the delivery? Right, so the delivery is uh, changing for sure. I think particularly with this pandemic, with everybody, everything's online, it's very, very hard to actually get them to the lab and then try to experience it with, with, uh, with, their, um, uh, with their hands and stuff like that. So I think certainly the creative approach is important. And I think the, the, uh, the university is changing how STEM is delivered, right? So a lot more, uh, interdisciplinary curriculum. I think that in a way uh, we embed STEM in, in different differently. So I think that's already starting to change. Um, uh, students are, even though you are an art major, you are supposed to take some of the STEM courses, for example. So those are already starting uh, the last couple of years. Um, and then um, uh, having said that, I would like to also emphasize that if they don't see STEM as being creative, uh, I think that perception needs to change. Uh, STEM is a very creative process. We do um, benefit from being creative as well as being systematic, right? So this is kind of an interesting hybrid at which you can actually do both. Uh, you can be, you cannot be creative in accounting, for example, <laughs> because then it will be. <laughs> well, I, I think you can. I'm not sure you, you want to be. <laughs> you want to be okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but in any case, uh, my point is that. Yes, it is a creative process. Do you have to be creative to succeed? Uh, that might be a different uh, discussion, but yes, it is an, a very exciting thing. I feel like I've never bored in my job, right? So it's always something new. What is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very, very nice. So I think that uh, having that as a marketing sort of way, uh, marketing STEM as being a creative process, I think that's a really good uh, angle. So one of the, I think one of the points that, were, that Melanie raised as a, as a finding um, that came out from the research was that the girls actually found um, STEM subjects to be difficult, right? Not just about the creativity side, but there's this uh, perception um, and they're stuck in this perception clearly that it's difficult. How do we get around that? Elizabeth, what do you think? Well, I have a personal experience with my daughters actually uh, saying that, right? And I think I've made the mistake of kind of perpetrating that notion by myself not uh, feeling that I wasn't the best student at math, for example, and, and perhaps saying that instead of countering that uh, thinking. But I think it goes back to how we test or how we teach it, right? Because I think I, I'll focus on math for a second because math tends to be viewed as inflexible. You know, you said, let's not be creative in accounting, right? So it's viewed as, as, as kind of inflexible and there's a specific number, like right? one plus one is always gonna be two. However, there are problem solving uh, methods that you can do in math that can have an open ended uh, answer, right? It's not a black or white answer. And I think nurturing that, that it's about how fast can you get to a solution or what kind of solution, how many different possibilities can you get to solving a problem might be the way to approach. And having more of those open ended uh, type of questions, for example, in teaching math, 
uh, would make a huge difference because right now, if I see a student, and, and my son is actually going through that right now, where it's pages and pages of worksheets and things that he has to memorize, like formulas he has to memorize, so that when the test comes, he'll be able to get that, ace that test, right? And that's the objective. I'm not sure that doing that, you know, I, I mean, there's a room for that, yes, but then there's that other applied math, I think, that needs to be there. And I remember in the younger years here at the American School in Singapore, they called it everyday mathematics. And you don't teach math. It was about seeing and experiencing math. You count the stairs you're going up as you're going up the stairs. You look at um, objects or your food and try to see which, whether which one is a quarter or a third or a fourth, right? Just by trying to estimate it based on the volume. You teach the abstract concepts with everyday experiences. It's not about teaching math. Same thing with creativity. I think that sometimes we try to teach creativity where, you know, and there's a creativity class that you're trying to do to correct all the years of, you know, kind of, uh, unlearning creativity out of our kids. And instead we should be nurturing an environment that encourages that. And I'm sure I'm, a, I'm, I'm uh, made those mistakes myself as a busy parent, for example. I think sometimes you just want to get things done and you come home and you want them to get their homework done, get their meals and all that. And your child might want to explore their food and they might want to look at the shapes or they might want to make bubbles in their bath and play, you know, or they might, you know, I don't know, make a mess in your kitchen where the things in your kitchen and you stop them because you don't want them to make a mess that you have to do that. But that's part of that exploration of the external environment, that discovery, that creativity that comes as part of the experience of, of a child, right? And I think we need to kind of ask ourselves, are we, and I think it was, um, um, and, and that are we taking that creativity out of our kids, right? They're born with it, but we're kind of teaching that out of, out of them and then they're trying to bring it back. And then when we want entrepreneurs, especially here in Singapore, then we're thinking, how come we don't have the mindset of an entrepreneur? That risk-taking, creative mindset comes from that, right? From that experience. So, you know, I think as parents, we also need to see what we're doing at home. Elizabeth, absolutely right. And I think yeah, spot on. And what you've actually done is answer one of the questions which Mitch um, put forward in, in the, in the Q&A um, function, which is the role of parents. So um, Melanie had talked about the role of the different influences and parents, family was critical. Parents can be so encouraging or otherwise, right? Siblings, um, peers and then role models. Um, Siren, can you talk to us about how you know this, this, particularly in the academic space, the role of, of you know educators, the role of, of peers um, as influences will also help steer young women, especially, to stay in STEM. Yeah, um, the. Role, the, the influence of a role model is certainly important, which is why it's part of our uh, connect approach in our powers program. And uh, we are aware of that. How much does it actually influence the choice and how that actually translate into longitudinal decision that the student is making? We are not very clear yet at this moment, particularly in the Singapore context. So what we are trying to do in, as part of our research actually addressing that. So we are developing a mentoring program which has been, uh, is developed because of the understanding that in keeping students in and then uh, influencing them throughout their pro pro process is actually by providing them a sense of belonging, that they belong in this field, they, they, are act they can excel, they can succeed in this particular environment. So that has been shown before. And I think we would like to uh, emphasize that that belongingness is important. And one way to do it is to actually develop the, the mentoring program. And then what is, a, there's a lot of mentoring program out there, but then what it would be an effective one. So, so we are actually running as we speak, we just finished a meeting today on how to actually do that exactly. We will be happy to share the data in the future uh, if, if there is any opportunity. Yeah, so 
Karen, we, we would love to, to hear about that. Uh, as it turns out, uh, United Women Singapore is actually in the midst of, of a pilot. Um, it's, a, it's a small pilot that we launched earlier this year look, um, where we're matching young women, 16, 17 year, year old, 18 year old uh, young women uh, to some of our, our uh, mentors who are in the corporate space, who are from the STEM, uh, from a STEM background, and um, where we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to take the results of this uh, pilot and share it with everybody else too, because we we're firm believers in obviously mentorship, um, sponsorship, and the provision of opportunities. Um, uh, Elizabeth, you spoke earlier about internships. Can you expand a little bit on that, um, uh, your own experience with, you know, what you're seeing in Cortiva, but also just in general, um, your thoughts around mentorship as, as a, the, one of these pathways, um, steps along this pathway to, to, uh, for, the, for young women's careers? Definitely. I think uh, the need for role models is definitely there. But as I said, it has to be relatable role models, right? So one of the things with the programs that we sometimes do, like one of them is in Australia, and I view that as a great model because they've got the program at the primary school, at secondary, and at college level, right? So that eventually they follow them so that these girls eventually go into careers in agriculture and, and even into PhD in, in agriculture, which is fascinating to see. And the whole program, and this is Picture You in Agriculture, by the way, is the name of the organization, you can look them up. And then looking at how do we learn from that experience and take that uh, model into other markets in Asia. And to me, that, that relatable experience, because when you sometimes have role models, they're very successful leaders. You usually put up you know, some great leaders, accomplished leaders with 20 plus years experience in let's say science, right? Yu Hong, one of my uh, colleagues here and heads up our lab in Singapore, she's got 20 plus years experience, right? For she then speaks to a room full of 300 chemistry students. For her to be able to speak to them and she talks about all the courses she did or her degrees, multiple degrees, very smart woman, right? And the work that she does on one level, that's one way of influencing the kids. But I think the other way she's able to experience them is when she actually talks about what inspired her. Like as a little girl, what was the, and she talks about Marie Curie, the story of Marie Curie being the one thing that she fell in love with that story and that became her fascination with becoming a chemist. And actually it's funny, but she does these programs at school where she's the one we sent to talk to schools and she used to talk about chemistry and all that she did that work and I help her change that and talk about how she fell in love with chemistry and she even found love in chemistry because she and her husband were in a lab together and that's how you know they've been married uh, for a long time. And to kind of humanize also those role models. So they have to be relatable in terms of what they do, but also relatable from that experience and human element, right? And finally, the other example I will tell you is in India and, and I'll link it back to what parents can do. A big challenge for parents why they don't want their girls to go into agriculture, sciences uh, for us, is because of safety. The notion of being out in the field is a big concern. So what do we do? And I think it goes back to what Professor Lim said about that sense of belonging. We also, as a company that wants to uh, empower women and have gender equality, then we have to commit to create that environment that's nurturing and that sense of belonging to our women. So we just started the program with 15 new grads and we committed all 15 of them were women so that we could increase the number of women in our field force. But we also put in safety measures to ensure from buddy system and make sure that there are public toilets in the field areas where they're going to do their work, that they could do their work safely and they could thrive at Corteva. So that's kind of like, you have to look at it every step of the way, right? The internship and the speaking at the school that's just one aspect of it. You have to follow that through from, you know, the onboarding, you know, how their first year of experience a company all the way to being able to promote them into leadership positions. I think if a company commits to gender equality, especially in the STEM careers, they have to do that in a much more systematic approach. And, and I think that's what we're trying to do by working with organizations that, like United Women Singapore. Thank you, Elizabeth. A question for you, Sierra, and if you can take this, is it's actually coming through our Q&A function. Uh, creativity aside, what other set of skills um, would be important uh, for the future, particularly in, in 
you know, for the next generation. And these could be, you know, human skills, human activity, uh, all the uh, in relation specifically to automation, digital AI and such. So, so what, what other skills would you deem as being really important to develop for the next generation? So this is really uh, a very important question because we are in the business of training the, the next workforce, basically. Uh, what in, what, one thing that we need to keep in mind is that Industry 4.0 really has changed. We go from steam engine to electronics to uh, programs. And then now we are really looking at more holistic. Everything is at the same time simultaneous uh, um, uh, activities rather than a process-driven systematic approach on every single step, right? Uh, so, so the kind of skill that an individual needs certainly changes. And we try to kind of bring that into our education at which the students are not just looking at a single subject, but they're also uh, doing a lot of problems and that the problems require multiple discipline to actually solve. So I think that uh, the ability to understand and communicate with people beyond one's field is very important. And, and uh, another thing is that your understanding on data, what is a valid data? Is data, is those data uh, reliable? Or are those, you know, basic understanding of statistics, for example, right? So we were talking about the survey and then is it significantly different? Is it, is it really, should we actually, look at 35% and 45% as a different, is it significant? So, so that kind of things I think is becoming more and more important, especially with the explosion of data. So um, I think th those are a few of those things, uh, plus the humanistic aspect, of course, uh, uh, with everything going online, the, our touch on, on a humanity uh, relationship between humans is becoming more and more important. Even I don't know how to teach that if through online situations, but but this really is something that we need to keep in mind as a, being an educator. That that uh, it is an important aspect. That's what makes us human. Thank you, Siren. Um, and and I just want to just uh, you know give you each a minute each uh, at the end. And I'm very conscious of time because everybody knows that we have, we will be ending at five on the dot. Um, Siren, if, if there was one thing that you wanted to leave the audience with about what we should be doing to help encourage young girls and women on this path uh, for STEM and keeping them, what should we all be doing and focusing on? So I would like to uh, have everybody to bring home and agree perhaps that STEM education is for everyone. It gives us so many different pleasures and knowledge and, and explorations and whatnot. So, but how do we use that? And then, and then use that STEM examples to have perhaps going to everyday life and then tell our children, our students, uh, whatnot, uh, that how that to relate that concept that they study in school to STEM, out to applications in real life. I think that would be very helpful if we can do that slowly. Thank you, Siren. Elizabeth, your thoughts on, again, what would you like to leave as, as a parting thought to this audience um, who have stayed with us this through, throughout this last hour? As how do we keep all these young girls and track more of them to this STEM pathway? I think of uh, especially where we are today, Georgette, it's a very complex, dynamic, world-changing world, especially during COVID, right? I think of some of the biggest problems in the world and I think any problem that we're gonna to try to solve, and for me, number one is climate change. You know, there's a role for STEM there, and but it's STEM in a in a in a bigger way, right? So it doesn't matter actually. So you so the company Corteva, it's kind of a, a microcosm, if you will, of all the different sciences, because it's not just biology and chemistry, even though I talked about that, but there's also a big chunk of it, analytics there. And but interpreting all that data, I think what Professor Lim was saying, I was smiling when you were saying that because. When I used to deal with uh, data analytics at, at HP, a lot of people thought that just because we were having all this analytics engine, suddenly you'd have jobs lost, right, in that process. And as someone still needs to ask the right questions and be able to get the insights at the other end of that analytics engine to be able to make some meaningful recommendations, right? It doesn't just happen automatically. And I think people forget that, that, that I see for me, as someone who's not actually a woman in STEM, 
I've always viewed STEM as the, as a tool, that information, right? But at the other end, it's it's making that impact. It's solving some of the biggest problems in the world. And that's why when I think of my career, for example, not being a woman in STEM, but having worked in healthcare for five years and technology for 14 years and now in agri-science, part of the reason I've been able to go from one to another and they're all STEM related um, co companies is because my passion has been addressing some of the biggest challenges in the world. So my, um, I would leave with girls is that they care about that. They care about the world. They care about the next generation for, because of that nurturing side of them, perhaps as, as mothers. And, and I think if you want, we want to solve some of the biggest problems in the world, then STEM is a key component of that. And we need both men and women, that diversity of thinking to be able to uh, get to the right solutions that we need. So I've been scribbling notes all throughout our discussion and the key takeaways for me, and I hope for everybody else here, awareness, exposure, definitely we saw that in the results, um, right connections, uh, exp and, and this goes back to this, the point of exposure and connections, building confidence, right? um, encouragement. This is really support opportunities, opening up pathways, opening up opportunities, whether it's an internship, sponsorships, traineeships, role models, the role of role models, whether it's at home, the workplace, school, the community, having role models, critical. And at the end of the day, changing this mindset. And that requires both men and women coming together to, to do that. Um, and I think the last thing that I want to, to, to say, and this is maybe a little bit of a plug for our Girls to Pioneers program too, is that while we always will recognize the importance um, of the STEM foundation and the STEM foundation, and again, to as to, to what um, Sirin was saying, it's applicability to, to life. It's also the layering in of those other elements, which you know we all classify as 21st century competencies, whether it's communication, presentation skills, critical thinking, collaboration, leadership, adaptability, all these things layered on, on top of a very strong STEM foundation. And I think we might have a real good recipe here for bringing those girls on a very successful pathway, not just lucrative pathway, but to Elizabeth's point, driven by purpose and impact for that, uh, again, for that next generation. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for staying on. I hope you enjoyed um, the, the session. I want to thank Sirin. I want to thank uh, Elizabeth and of course, Melanie for presenting the results. Thank you so much for all your continued support. Please continue to follow us. We'll be posting some of these results up to um, so keep checking our website, keep checking our social media. Um, and, you know, I, I think Siren in, indicated this should be a pleasure. STEM should be a pleasure. So that's what we're going to work at making STEM pleasurable for all our young women. Thank you so much, everybody. On behalf of United Women Singapore, have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. If you have a moment, please give your feedback. You see the, the QR code, we'd appreciate feedback. Thank you. <laughs>